Good evening, show on the road here. I see a lot of new faces who have never been here before. My own story of our life. We've been here 20 years. You haven't found us yet? Just Anyway, for those of you who haven't been here before or didn't know about us, let me give you a two minute history of the observatory. We started since 1997, 1998, with the design and the building of the uh, facility after that telescope was donated from Mount Wilson Observatory in California. In 1999, we opened the facility, and the building was locked off right there where the blue line is in the first row of chairs. So we had a small classroom and one dome. Then pretty soon it turned out we outgrew the facility in 2006, 2007, we expanded the facility into the second dome, second telescope. Since then, we've had over 77,000 visitors through here. And since we're not nerdy astronomers, we're right next to the school in the football field. We're more educators. <laughs> the seeing conditions are not the greatest here because we're on the east side of the Rocky Mountains. We have a lot of turbulence when the jet stream hits the mountains. It starts to roll, things are twinkling, which is, of course, very romantic, but not so good for astronomy. Everything kind of moves on you. Um, we're run by an all volunteer crew. Um, nobody has ever been paid here, although people feel like they, they should have. I mean, <laughs> building a whole building, right? For nothing. <laughs> anyway, we're always looking for volunteers, so if you want to look for a volunteer opportunity, go online on the starkids.org website and sign up as a volunteer. We'll train you in running the telescopes, or if you're a ham, we'll get you involved in the radio astronomy program. We also do since the last four or five years, Terry, is that how long we've done this? Uh, about four years. Doing some really interesting scientific research with the radio telescope. So that's kind of an interesting other area of interest to us. Uh, what else can I tell you? We do mostly show and tell. We're open by appointment every day or night of the week, basically, except Sundays when we reserve it for our own volunteers or if they want to come play, they can play with the telescopes. Which, if you volunteer, you can do too. So, hint, hint, right? Um, and we get groups from young kids from preschool all the way up to the community colleges. We get old folks' homes, we get families, we get birthday parties. We get it all. So, don't feel shy about making an appointment and bringing your family out here. It's kind of a fun place. The only thing we ask from you is that you bring clear skies. We still haven't quite figured that out yet. And of course, the radio telescope doesn't care about clouds, so these guys are here all the time. But for the optical side, we have to cancel quite a few nights, especially the last couple of years. It's been very cloudy. I don't know if it's because more people are moving to birth, the climate is changing, a combination of factors, who knows? Star, the Star Kids. Okay, Star Kids. Um, 
looking for observatories in the area? Not many. Okay. Um, we're always struggling to try to find the best way to get the word out to the community, so it really does help us to know how you found out about us. Um, <clears throat> we normally put on um, a monthly program 11 months out of the year. July, we're usually closed for maintenance, but every other month of the year, normally the third Friday of the month, we have a public program. And most of those have to do with optical astronomy. But once a year, we like to invite a, um, uh, a, a topic on radio astronomy, because as Micah and Terry mentioned before, about four years ago, we set up, in addition to our optical telescopes, a radio telescope. And if anybody wonders what that is, our chief scientist, Dr. Terry Bullitt, who is here in the bluish shirt, um, and I would be glad to talk to you about that and explain what our programs are and how it works. One of our other radio volunteers is upstairs in, in the optical dome. He will be down in a few minutes. Uh, Ted Klein is his name. So either of us would be glad to talk to you about our radio programs. And if you have an interest in it, we would really appreciate hearing from you on that. How many ham radio operators do we have here? Anybody? We've got a few. Um, Dr. Jones is K6BJ. And um, so if you're ever looking uh, for him and you uh, misplaced the uh, bio information we have on it, you can look him up as K6DJ. Well, with that as a background, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Jones, from uh, Space Sciences Institute in Boulder, where he's one of the principal research scientists, and he's in a very fortunate position of being able to select and choose and propose his own research projects. Most of us go through life having to scramble and work for somebody else, but he's advanced to the place now where he can pretty much pick and choose his research interest. Prior to that, he was a scientist with a Jet Propulsion Laboratories in California, but he's moved all over the country, and we're very fortunate he's decided to settle near here. So it's been about a year since David was here last. Um, but a lot of things are happening. One of the programs that he helped get started, the Square Kilometer Array, which David will explain in detail later on. Um, at one time, the United States was one of the major partnership countries with this incredible research undertaking. For various financial reasons, the United States has backed out. But during the time that we were involved, Dayton was one of the eight principal committee members uh, working on the early development of this concept. So with that, I'm sure Dayton can correct things I got wrong. Dayton Jones. Thank you. Good evening. Thanks for being here. Is this, is this volume good? Okay, great. So I'm going to talk um, partly about things that I covered when I was here a few years ago, and if anybody was here for that previous talk, a little of this might seem familiar, but an awful lot of it is new material, so hopefully the people who saw the earlier version won't be, uh, won't be bored for very long. I'm going to uh, talk about two different things. First is, and as, uh, as you can see, the Square Kilometer Array, which is the major international facility uh, intended for radio astronomy for the next several decades. And it's, uh, there's a lot, uh, I will go up through some of the scientific uh, rationale for this and how it ended up being designed the way it has. Um, a little bit about the, uh, the politics. And then I'm gonna go to a second topic, which is related to what you just heard, that the SKA started out as a multinational project from its inception and the U.S. was one of the major partners in this for many years, and decided uh, around 2011 that it was not, the National Science Foundation was not going to be able to come up with um, our share of funding under the current plan. So we 
since then have not formally been an active partner, although many US scientists have been deeply involved still. But there is a new US-led project which will complement the SKA, which is going to be one of the major uh, things being presented to the government for funding during the next decade. And if that goes ahead, it will essentially be, in, in a political sense, the US contribution to this large international project. This would be terrific because it means that US scientists, even though the US isn't paying for the SKA construction, we will get time on the SKA facility. Scientists from the rest of the world will get time on the US facility. Everybody will be happy. We shall see if that comes to pass, but it is a possibility. So the SKA, besides being a very big and ambitious project, is not too surprisingly a very expensive project. This is so often the way. And so to justify that sort of investment, you have to have a really compelling science case. Over a long period of time, the international community came up with seven key science areas, which are the main drivers behind both, both selling the array as a concept and also driving the detailed design of exactly what it needs to be able to do. So, so those are, I mean, these are all high-level things that, that large, large uh, communities are behind. Testing general relativity, and that's one of the big ones that people are always interested in. Um, I'll talk a little bit later about the ways the SKA is going to address this. Cradle of life is referring to things like planet formation, um, organic molecule distribution through the universe, search for extraterrestrial intelligence, um, basically you know, how did systems like our solar system come to be. Cosmic magnetism is a, an eternal mystery area. I mean, why do we even have magnetic fields on scales of clusters of galaxies. There's, it's not at all obvious why those even exist. Cosmic dawn is referring to the epoch when the first generation of stars turned on, basically when the universe went from being basically just cold hydrogen gas and completely dark to having sources of visible light and high energy emission. Galaxy evolution is sort of the more recent. How did we go from that to the universe we see around us today? galaxies, billions of galaxies like ours and clusters of galaxies, and a, a universe where mass is, is essentially concentrated in galaxies with tremendously large, nearly empty voids in between. There's a whole evolutionary process that goes from the Big Bang to that kind of structure that we see around us now. And cosmology, of course, is, is always sort of the, the biggest picture view of things. Why do we have dark matter and dark energy? What the hell are they? It's just mortifying that we have no clue. And, and how did this, this large scale structure that we are embedded in now uh, evolve? And finally, the seventh one, over which there was actually a lot of controversy, the exploration of the unknown, which of course historically has always turned out to be the most valuable contribution of practically every major new instrument ever created in science. They're almost always famous in the long run for finding things that were never mentioned in the science case that was used to propose them and justify their funding. And there's no reason to imagine that this facility won't be similar. This is controversial because when you think about it, what, what do you mean by a facility that's good at exploring the unknown? It's, it's a facility that covers observational parameter space. It's lots of frequency coverage, lots of sensitivity, lots of spectral resolution, lots of angular resolution, you know, more of everything, which is terrific. That's how you find new things. You you look in an area of parameter space you couldn't look at before, and you're likely to be surprised. But all of those things drive the cost. So that's, that, this ended up staying in there, and it is one of the drivers of the design, but it was recognized that if you're going to make an instrument that is good at this, you're going to give up some capabilities and everything else, because you know, there is a finite cost cap that you have to live with. So, I mean, obviously, the fundamental parameters that you want in an instrument for a field like radio astronomy are things like sensitivity and resolution. So for sensitivity, this is showing what, uh, what the SKA is supposed to be able to do. These red lines, this is low far the low frequency array in Europe and the Jansky very large array in Mexico, these red lines are the current state of the art, the most sensitive instruments that we have at the moment at, at low frequencies down here at hundreds of megahertz and high frequencies up here at several gigahertz and tens of gigahertz. This black line and blue line are what the first phase of the SKA 
is supposed to be able to provide. The first phase is essentially the first 10% of the full array. This is essentially a, a political requirement. If you're going to have a, a many year, many billion dollar project, you'd better be able to convince the funding agencies that you know what you're doing. So if you get funding for a small part of it, prove that you can produce the hardware for the cost you said, prove that it works the way you said, basically show that you're actually ready for funding to build out the entire array. So that's what SKA-1 means. That's, that's the first, essentially, 10% of the full array. And then the purple line, SKA-2, is the, the full plan square kilometer array. And you know, notice these are logarithmic scales, so each of these is a factor of 10 in sensitivity. So we're talking about a really major advancing capability there. Do you mind the, what was the scale on the left? Let's see if we can go back. Yeah. Meter the, the, this is a, well, it, it's a unit of sensitivity. Meter squared per degree Kelvin combines the actual physical collecting area, the aperture you have in, in square meters, with the sensitivity of the receiver. So the Kelvin there is talking about the noise temperature of the receiving system. So both of those contribute to the sensitivity. It is admittedly a somewhat uh, arcane unit. Okay, so the other thing that you really want more of, always, inevitably, is angular resolution. So for a single antenna, that's just related to the size of the antenna. This is just diffraction. The bigger the dish, the smaller the beam, and the higher the angular resolution. But when you can use interferometry, which you can at radio wavelengths, you can combine signals from lots of different antennas like a very large array here. And you end up, by combining those signals electronically, able to get the resolution you get of a single dish the size of the entire array. So now you can scale this up arbitrarily and get exquisitely high resolution, basically limited by money and the physical size of the Earth. So radio astronomy can be extremely powerful that way. You, you can have an almost arbitrary number of possibly very small and inexpensive antennas combine all those signals in a, in a hardware device called a correlator and get the equivalent resolution of the, even an intercontinental size radio array. So just as an example, that 100 meter green bank telescope I showed before at a wavelength of 1 centimeter, which is about 30 gigahertz, Pretty typical radio astronomy frequency gives you an angular resolution of about 20 arc seconds, which is about a third of the resolution of your eye at visible wavelengths. So you know, the sky, the sky would look a little sharper than it looks when you look up on it through night. Except really oh, yeah. the very large array has a maximum separation between antennas of about 35 kilometers. So that same wavelength of one centimeter, that's a tenth of an arc second of resolution, which is about two kilometers of the distance of the moon. So that's, that's already getting to be pretty good. If you expand that through interferometry and get up 10,000 kilometers, essentially as, as long a baseline as you can get on the Earth at that one centimeter wavelength, now you're talking about micro arc settings. So you're talking about centimeter kinds of scales in the distance of the moon. And if you then do one more trick and go to a much shorter wavelength, like one millimeter, which is still, still being observed from the surface of the Earth, that sort of a array can give you an angular resolution of just a few centimeters on the moon. And when you translate what that means in terms of being able to study different physical regions and different radio sources, as I'll show in some images, images later on, it's revolutionary. Okay, so this is, this is all well and good, but you know you have to actually negotiate a way to make this all happen. At the moment, these are the uh, 11 countries that are members of the SKA consortium. These nine countries in Africa are not contributing money, but they are contributing sites for some of the antennas. So the blue, the blue countries here are all the, the funding countries, basically. There are several others, like Portugal and Spain, that are in, in the, and uh, Japan, that are all in negotiation to join this, but that hasn't, uh, hasn't been finalized. One thing that's changed dramatically in just the last year is that the SKA has now gone from a somewhat informal memorandum of understanding level organization between these various countries to an actual treaty organization. So 
because it'll be the second treaty organization that's ever been created for astronomy, the first being the European Southern Observatory decades ago. This is like CERN for particle physics. This is, this is countries saying, we commit ourselves to funding the construction of this facility. So it's, it's a major deal politically for that to happen. The SKA headquarters is at Jago Bank. This is the iconic um, Jago Bank radio telescope. And this building here is the, the SKA headquarters building, which shows up a little better in summertime. <laughs> it's a nice building and it has room for further expansion. So you may have noticed that several of those key science cases I started with involve hydrogen, things like galaxy evolution, cosmology, the, the uh, dark ages, and the epoch of realization. All of those are based upon studying hydrogen gas at very high redshifts, very great distances. Hydrogen conveniently has a radio line that's, that's at 21 centimeters here on Earth. If you were looking at it from very far away, then that redshift is, or oh, that, that uh, wavelength is redshifted to be a much longer wavelength when we see it, a much lower observing frequency. So we can, for example, at a redshift of 35 beyond the epic gravitation into the dark ages, the, the frequency of that hydrogen line is seen at 40 megahertz instead of 14, 20 megahertz where you see it in the laboratory. So this line provides a tracer throughout almost the whole history of the universe. And by studying it, you can, you can watch what's happened from essentially the Big Bang here, where now you know, things fade away so you don't have the, the cosmic microwave background source anymore, you just have ever expanding and cooling hydrogen gas, and little helium thrown in. And, and what you can see is that the signal gets faint, it gets strong, it gets really faint, it's really strong. It varies with time, and that's the same thing as varying in the frequency that we receive it at. By studying this, we can actually map what's been going on over, over this otherwise essentially unobservable early period of the universe until stars and galaxies formed and provided their own radiation for us to detect. Now this, this big feature here, this absorption feature in hydrogen, occurs when the first stars start to heat the, the uh, medium surrounding them. Those first stars are huge almost pure hydrogen stars, hundreds, possibly thousands of times the mass of our sun. They're nothing like the stars we see around us now, partly because they have no heavy elements. These are the stars that created the first heavy elements, but they haven't done it yet. So it's a very different environment. It is conceivable that we have already detected that absorption feature. This is really controversial. This is from a single antenna experiment in the Australian desert, an experiment called Edges. This is, well, redshift or frequency or age of the universe. You know, they're, all, they're all related. And this is showing this very big absorption trough here at about the redshifts where it's expected to be. So this is great, and this is a Nobel Prize kind of thing, except nobody else has been able to confirm it. So, despite an incredible amount of excitement, it's probably something instrumental. But we, we don't know that for sure. Nobody really knows if that's a real detection or not, but it's getting to look more and more worrisome for the EDGES team. But this is the kind of thing that we, we want to find. With the SKA, the sensitivity there will make this detection not, not ambiguous. I mean, it will be a tremendously high signal to noise detection, which means you can detect not just a spectral feature like this, which tells you a fair bit, but it tells you about this sort of integrated over the whole sky. With the SKA, it will be possible to actually map that <coughs> signal in three dimensions, do a tomographic movie of the evolution of large-scale hydrogen. So here's us down here, and this is looking farther and farther away from us, and therefore farther and farther back in time and you know, this is our universe, galaxies, clusters of galaxies, the sort of thing that you see with the Hubble Deep Field image. You see the same thing in any direction. If you look back far enough, you start to see fewer and fewer galaxies and more and more of this um, neutral hydrogen gas in, in all the 
about your medium in between. If you go back far enough, you get to the, the uh, glow from the Big Bang that causes the gossip microwave background. So energy, that structure, is one of the top goals of the SKA, something that's simply not possible with any existing instrument. So one other thing I'll mention on the, the science side is you can probably, a lot of you might have heard maybe three years ago now, there was a very big discovery that made all the, the science press about the detection of gravitational waves by the LIGO observatories. This is, this is a paper from that. And this is one of the two LIGO observatories. These are optical interferometers. They just bounce back and forth in these long evacuated pipes. And they look at the microscopic changes in the lengths of those two arms by looking, by interfering the laser beams together and looking at small shifts in the fringes. That lets them see fluctuations in space time because as a gravitational wave goes past this, one of these arms will be slightly lengthened, one will be slightly shortened. You'll see a phase shift and you'll see it go the other way. And you'll see this at two separate sites if it's a real signal. So in fact, in this case, they saw it at three separate sites because there was a similar thing in, uh, in Italy that was also online, also saw this. So, in this case, it was two black holes spiraling together and finally merging into a single larger black hole. This happens very quickly, seconds, fractions of a second, really. You can see here, here's the time scale. The final merger is all less than a second. And this is the theoretically predicted gravitational wave signal that you get from that kind of a violent event. And this is what was, in fact, detected. So that's all very cool. But these are stellar mass kind of black holes. If you're interested in, in big questions in you know, what's going on in the centers of galaxies, then you really are interested in supermassive black holes, things that are a billion times the mass of the sun. They also can merge. When they merge, they generate tremendously strong gravitational radiation, but at very, very low frequencies, because this is a much, much slower process. All the scales are much bigger for these massive bodies which means you can't really detect those kind of gravitational waves with an interferometer at any wavelength that's just sitting on the surface of the Earth. But you can if you use an interferometer that's spread over a fair fraction of the size of our galaxy. And that's what the SKA will do. These are supposed to indicate pulsars. These are rotating neutron stars with little beams of radio emission. If they happen to sweep past the Earth as the neutron star rotates, we get these periodic bursts of emission from the pulsar, they, they are very stable clocks. So we can time the arrival of the pulses from each pulsar very accurately. If you have an array that can time pulsars in many different directions, what you expect to see is that, in fact, the pulses arrive slightly too soon from some directions and slightly delayed from other directions. And you know, if the geometry is favorable, you can deduce that those are in fact due to very, very long wavelength gravitational waves from these supermassive black hole mergers. So this is just sort of showing what you can do with gravitational waves. It is the frequencies of gravitational waves, it's fractions of a hertz. So this is this is uh, sort of a hundred hertz or sorry, about 100 seconds, and down here we're talking about pretty much the age of the universe, and this is you know, the years kind of time scale. And so the ground-based interferometers are already detecting gravitational radiation there. Space-based ones in the solar system, there's a proposal between NASA and ESA for a mission called LISA, which may fly in maybe 20 years. It's very ambitious, technically, but that will cover this frequency range. Pulsar timing, by arrays like the square atomic array will cover this frequency range. We will get all of that in due time. Now, what's going on right now, in reality, there's actual hardware. This is a prototype of the low frequency antennas for phase one of the square atomic array deployed on the SKA site in Western Australia. That's uh, one of the two sites where the arrays are going to be built. There's a Thing called a dense aperture array that was developed primarily in Europe. These are individual antennas, and they're, they're, they look kind of funny. They look you know, like something you can squeeze juice on, maybe. They're called multi antennas. They have the advantage of covering the very 
wide range of frequencies. And so you put thousands of these together and combine all the signals digitally, and you get not only higher resolution, but you get the flexibility of being able to have many different beams in different directions from this, this same set of antennas. Nothing here is moving, it's all electronics. So you build this array of antennas, and you can have as many beams on the sky as you can afford in digital processing, which of course gets cheaper and cheaper all the time. So that's where you want to be putting your future expansion. Which means that in the future, at these wavelengths, astronomers won't be stuck with having one facility that looks at that part of the sky because some scientist proposed some experiment or some observation to look over there. You can have that, that astronomer doing that and some group from the public looking for SETI over there, some other group looking at pulsars over here, some other group looking at hydrogen over there, all simultaneously, and all getting the full collecting area of the entire array. So it's, it's a way to change the sociology of big science facility access. I mean, right now, big science facilities are, kind of by definition, expensive, they're valuable resources, you have to go through a long and laborious process of vetting and reviewing and refereeing your observing proposals before you can hope to be given a little tiny sliver of observing time on some major facility. But if you have a hundred beams on the sky, you can have a lot more flexibility to like some of the some of the more speculative proposals, some of the things that could have a big payoff but nobody really thinks they're gonna work. Give them a shot. Because it's only costing you one of your hundred beams to do that. So I think it's gonna it's gonna be a very exciting sociological development in the field. So this is just the, the prototype for the high frequency dish antenna part of this square kilometer array. Those are all going to go in South Africa primarily, in this area here in the Karoo Desert. This is this is uh, Cape Town here at Cape Good Hope down there, South Africa. The blue is where people live. So you know this is a great place to put radio observatory. It will also include antennas up, you know, individual small antennas up into uh, other parts of Africa for higher resolution, but the bulk of the collecting area will be right there in the crew. What's there now is this. This is a, a small array, well, 64 antennas, small by SKA standards, big by most other standards, called Meerkat, and these are not exactly the design of the SKA antennas, but very close, and this array is now observing, producing science, and will be incorporated into the larger SPA as more antennas are added. This was essentially, this was, again, politics. This was South Africa's bid to say, you know, we're really interested in radio astronomy. We want to host the SKA. We're going to prove that this is a good site, and no interference, you know, we can, we can put in the infrastructure, and it's actually worked really, really well. This is a recent image that's produced. This is this is the galactic plane, and this is this is the galactic center region, this bright area there. This is a huge, many degree on the side field of sky. This huge bubble of emission here, this one down on the other side too, that I don't show, wasn't really known before. This is, this is a new discovery, and it indicates that there's been a large amount of star formation in this region of the galactic disk millions of years ago that's driven gas out of the galactic disk. And this is, this is just the kind of thing that uh, Meerkat was designed to, to study. As I say, it's working very well. The other site, the SKA, is in Western Australia. Again, it's an area where nobody lives. <laughs> and except telescopes, they live there. This is the uh, Australian SKA prototype called ASCAP. There's, um, Oh, what are there? 36 of these dishes. And they, you know, same sort of thing. Australia's proving, yeah, we can do a big raise here, give us the SKA. That's why they both ended up being sites for the SKA, because this is what you do politically with a big international project. You never have a loser, so you have to have multiple winners. And this is a recent image made by ASCAP. This is a, a radio image of hydrogen gas being blown out of a small Magellanic cloud. Look at the detail there. It's, it's just astonishing. This, this is basically showing that the small the Magellanic cloud is losing all of its interstellar gas. It's not going to be able to form stars in the future at all. 
It's a galaxy that's in the process of dying. And what's there now is an Australian <coughs> low frequency ray. This is a, a bunch of dipole antennas, 16 of them per tile, and tiles going out to the horizon just about. They've done a lot of good work with that. Mostly proving to the world that this is a really good artifact, quite a sight. And this is again that prototype of the SKA low frequency antenna. Um, actual photographs, not artists' conceptions. And so where are we? In this whole thing. The SKA has gone through you know, years of evolving the science base and figuring out the overall architecture and the number of different types of antennas with all, all sorts of technical trade-offs involved. They've gone through the detailed design of the various subsystems of lots of, not just the antennas, but you know, hundreds of thousands of kilometers of fiber optics and huge supercomputers to do the data processing and just, you know, just powering the whole thing. Where do you get the gigawatts? There's lots and lots of interesting design work there. And it comes down to the final level of review before you go to the agencies in all these countries and say, here's the proposal, give us the money. So these are called critical design reviews. So sort of the end final stage of both. multiple levels of more and more robust reviews of what you're designing and what you're planning to do. The critical design review is the last thing you do before you get funded. There are 10 of these areas, which I'm sure you can't read, but they're all the things you'd expect, like data transport, signal processing, antenna designs, and all the bits and pieces you need to make an array like this work. Ten of, uh, sorry, eight of these 10 have now been successfully passed. They've gone through their whole review in front of multiple international committees and convinced everybody, at least enough people, that yes, we know what we're doing, we can build it for what we say, it will do what we say, give us the money. Two of them are not quite done yet, but they are you know, in process, they don't have major problems, they were just the two of them were at the end of the queue. So they're going to be, their critical design reviews will be completed sometime in the next six months. And then we'll see about the funding. So, I'm going to transition now to the second topic, which is the next generation very large array. This is what the United States decided it was going to do after it stopped being part of this growth on the And I should say right up front that this was not, a, not an easy decision, and certainly not a popular one with a lot of the radio community, because among other things, it pretty much guaranteed that the US astronomers were not going to have access to observing time on the SKA when it's completed, because we're not paying for any of it. And even though the U.S. has always had what they call an open skies policy, where proposals of scientists anywhere in the world are considered for time on U.S. facilities, and we've always thought, I think correctly, that that is the best policy for everyone to adopt to get the best science done, the other partner countries and the rest of the world don't generally operate that way. It's much more of a quid pro quo system, and you know we're not putting our money on the table, so we're not going to get the observing time. But this could change that whole situation. It's basically building out from the existing JSC very large array, most sensitive array at centimeter wavelengths at the moment, uh, based in New Mexico. And then next generation very large array will have 10 times the collecting area, 10 times the angular resolution, and a wider frequency range. So this is also a very ambitious project. And it's, uh, it's also you know, not an inexpensive project, but it's less expensive than the square kilometer array by quite a bit. It is, in fact, less expensive than the US contribution to the square kilometer array would have been had everything gone on as it looked like it might have 15 years ago. Partly that's because technology has marched on. So here's one of those wonderful political plots that people use when they're justifying their latest brainstorm. This shows, of course, that the next generation VLA beats everything in the world by a huge amount, and so you can't possibly not love it. If you look a little more carefully, I mean, to be honest, there are really good arguments for the NG VLA, and I'm going to, to get to those, but this is just one of those things that I have to editorialize about. This is frequency here, and it shows correctly that the, the next generation VLA goes up to much higher frequencies than the SKLA or the existing very large array. 
In fact, it goes up to all the frequencies that the Alma Array in Chile, a millimeter array, covers. And it does have much more um, collecting array sensitivity than the very large array does have or that Alma has. So all this is true. This is, this is not, the notice, meter square for K or anything funny like that. This is just collecting area. Which is, so you're, you're not comparing apples and apples here to start with. And also, this is just phase one of the square column array that they've chosen to plot here for comparison. SKA phase two will be somewhere over above the top edge of the chart. But of course, that is farther in the future. There's no absolute guarantee it will be built. So, you know, it's not lying, it's just being economical with the truth. So, so this is this is a big step over what we're going to have anywhere else in the in the near future, certainly. And it also has, of course, its own key science goals. A lot of them are based on the fact that the U.S. radio astronomy community has historically been most interested in high frequency work. Um, for one reason, there's a lot of molecular lines and high radio frequencies. There's you know, the ability to get much higher angular resolution for a similar size instrument. Um, there's a lot you can do studying the evolution of solar systems, looking at the distribution of organic molecules, um, looking at bright, compact, distant objects with very high resolution that are closer in the central entrance in their cores. And so that's always been compelling to the US. Um, much of the rest of the world, particularly in Europe, they've historically been much more interested in low frequencies. Um, that's partly just the way technology developed after World War II, that took some different paths and just you know, sociological differences. So that's part of what was always an issue with the SKA original collaboration. So there were these competing forces to emphasize different frequency bands. The SKA, in the end, focused entirely on low and middle frequencies. That they could go up to several gigahertz, but no higher in any of their antenna designs. The US community has come up with a system that will do this high frequency science. And just as an example, this is an area of, uh, this is megahertz, so these are sort of 24 to 27 gigahertz, not super high, but high enough to make the point that all these interesting molecules have a gazillion spectral lines in this part of the spectrum. So many lines that you get multiple ones from just about any molecule, and you can actually study the physical conditions that molecule is in, not just that there's some amino acid there. So this is an extremely rich area for spectral line observations. And I'm going to give a show a short whoops. I'm going to show a short video here about uh, how the NGBLA will, will be able to study the uh, solar system formation. This does not have hokey music, I think, so you're, you're safe from that. But it does have text, so you don't have to listen to me for a minute. Basically, this is this is a, a true image from Alma. This isn't uh, just an artist thing. This is a disk of dust around this this uh, recently formed star, and these gaps are where planets are formed, accreting dust from that orbital region to make those gaps. But with Alma, you can only see you know, on scales bigger than our entire solar system. That's that's cool, but it's not really what people are interested. People are interested in what's going on here on scales. Like our planetary system, we'd like to see other Earths be, being formed. And so here's, here's what the NGBLA would um, be able to do. That says 5 AU in the middle? Yes, that's 5 AU. So that's, um, that's sort of half the distance of Jupiter. And that, that, of course, is supposed to be a terrestrial planet forming with organic molecules going into the measure. And these are the spectral lines of those molecules by which you can actually see if they're there or not. And there you go, proto Earth. That is not an image we expect in GDLA. <laughs> 
So another thing that you can do with this, this um, the higher resolution you get at higher frequencies is look closer into the supermassive black holes that power activity in the centers of just all massive galaxies. This is M87 and the amateur astronomers know that well. It's a very famous nearby elliptical galaxy with an optical jet shooting out from the nucleus. It has a beautiful radio jet corresponding to that also. And in the very center there, there's this, the base of the jet, where this is the core, and the angular resolution here is just a few, I, you can see there's six short shell radii, so it's looking right in to the, to the region where the jets are first being accelerated and formed and collimated. And that's something that uh, a lot of people are very interested in. Um, gravitational lensing, I mentioned before, there's a particular aspect to that that the um, NGVLA will be very hopeful with. This is a, a computer simulation of gravitational lensing by a black hole here. This partial ring of light around the black hole is actually this light from the galactic plane being lensed. And if this will work, <laughs> we will actually see how, how cool that is as if the black hole goes in front of the, the plane, you get a complete circle around it. And that's relevant because if you think about what a black hole of the, at the center of a galaxy should look like, there should be an accretion disk around it. And the black hole will lens the emission from that disk. And you should see something like this. This is a simulation of a black hole that has an accretion disk the accretion disk is orbiting the black hole and it is very much brighter on one side than the other. And that's because this is the side where the material in the disk is actually coming towards you. And it's a combination of boosting you the material moving towards you and the gravitational lensing that's giving this bright feature here and a fainter one. So it's all the way all the way around. There's, there's disk emission around behind the black hole. And what we have recently seen with a, a set of Telescopes operating at millimeter wavelengths called the Event Horizon Telescopes. This is just a handful of telescopes, but they're scattered all over the world and operating at the highest frequencies that you can from inside the Earth's atmosphere. So they have very high angular resolution, and they looked at M87 and they made that image, which is just astonishing. It's practically exactly what you would expect to see if this system has a supermassive black hole with a rapidly rotating accretion disk around it. So this, and you know, this is 0.1% of the sensitivity that the NGVLA will have. So the reference design, it, it's very much like the mid-frequency ditches of the SKA, but they're smaller, they're designed to operate at much higher frequencies. They're the same sort of offset Gregorian, where there's a reflector here, emission comes from straight down, bounces off that, bounces off this mirror off to the side, and then down to the receivers. So it's completely unblocked, there's no speed support legs or anything to get in the way of the radiation. A very low noise design. And the way they have designed it, which this will show, maybe. Don't know about videos. This design has been uh, optimized remarkably for low for mass production and low cost. This backup structure is very easily produced from uh, carbon fiber materials, very low expansion, very lightweight, very stiff to weight. It, it's really, although it looks the first order like a typical radio telescope, it's actually technically a very different thing from you know, typical metal structures that, uh, that have been used today. So this, the, the point is that each of these telescopes is much, much less expensive than a traditional telescope for these short wavelengths able to be before. And this is just showing the central PLA three arm site antennas around New Mexico, which is where it's going to be centered, but also extending now out into, uh, into western Texas and even a few into northern Mexico. These are the boundaries of New Mexico here. There's Texas over there, and this is Mexico down here. And then you can add the existing telescopes with the very long baseline array, these pink dots, which already exist. And 
although they don't go all the way to the very highest frequency for the NGBLA, they cover most of it. And that will give you the sort of intercontinental baselines and angular resolution that uh, will make the studies of uh, the finest structured objects possible. Dayton, you spoke of carbon fiber. Yes. Carbon fiber, so is not metal, so it doesn't reflect, or is carbon, it just, carbon fiber, or is it just convenient it, to cheat? It's partly it's, it's partly conductive, but in fact, that's just for the backup structure. So you don't need you, you, there will be a, a metalized surface on the front to do the the reflecting. Carbon fiber itself isn't the reflecting material; it's just the the strength material. So it's strength and lightness. Yeah, and, and, and very low uh, coefficient of thermal expansion. I see. So the sun can shine on it, and it doesn't just okay. go all like a potato chip. As aluminum, for example, would do. Okay. Um, this is just the same thing in, in stills. This is that central core of the antennas and this intermediate. Uh, okay, this, these are called log, log spiral arms, which turn out to have very good imaging properties. And then this is the full extent of the array, not counting those very long base on array stations. So up to Santa Fe, down here to, I guess, around the Fort Davis area in Texas, Tucson, and down a few into, into northern Mexico. And the whole thing with the, the more extended VLBA antennas included. So that's, I mean, that's a really powerful instrument there. And so here's, here's where we are on this. The, the, U.S. and the SKA worked together for probably 20 years towards this next generation instrument design. And, and that basically, the formal high level collaboration ended around 2010. There's still a lot of collaboration going on at the you know, institute at an individual level, but not at the government agency level. So the SKA is getting, getting ready to start construction of its phase one. Um, the CASA software package, which developed primarily at the National Radio Observatory, National Radio Astronomy Observatory in the U.S., will be the primary uh, software for data analysis for the SKA Phase One. So there is still that, that connection. Um, but there's no real likelihood that the, the, the government is going to turn around and say, oh yeah, well, we made a mistake, we want to be part of the SKA now. It's not totally clear that the other partners would, would welcome us at this point. But we do have now this proposal for the next generation VLA. This is, well, let me remind you if you don't know, every decade the U.S. astronomy community puts together something called a decadal survey. This goes to the National Science Foundation, to NASA, to the Department of Energy. It is basically a prioritized list of what the community consensus is that are the most important things to invest in for the next 10 years, both the ground-based facilities and space missions. And the fact that the astronomy community has spontaneously been willing to go through all the hair pulling and screaming and banging on the table involved and getting a consensus on things, for, you know, everybody's got their favorite thing they want to propose and they all cost more money than there is. So the fact that the community is doing that and giving a prioritized list to the government is really considered exemplary and valuable. Hardly any other communities funded by the government do this. And so it carries a lot of weight. It carries a lot of weight with Congress. It heads for several cycles now through many decades. And so this is the process by which new, major new things like the NGBLA can come into existence. If you know, This is the, the biggest thing being studied in the radio community right now in all the meetings preparing for this decadal review that would be going in just after 2020. If it turns out the NGBLA is indeed ranked the highest priority thing for the U.S. to do in ground-based astronomy, historically, that means the odds are extremely good that Congress will fund it. If there's third or fourth on that list, the odds are very murky. But this could well be the highest priority thing, in which case it will go ahead and if so, then we have this, you know, this golden world possibility where everybody, in fact, ends up getting access to everybody's instrument to do whatever the best science is. And that, uh, that would be an ideal outcome. You, you talked about funding. What about the next level of the space, uh, 
tunnel. I don't think we're going to replace that. Yep, but, but there are separate separate lists for ground-based and space-based oh. because essentially that's NSF and NASA, so they're separate agencies. And also, realistically, there's separate orders of magnitude of funding. I mean, a small or medium science mission for NASA would cost more than the NGPLA. I mean, space is, space is expensive. So they, they just treat those as... It's the same committees that, that come up with all of this, but they treat them as completely separate lists because, realistically, they have to be administered that way. So we're not trying to compete directly with the next generation Hubble or anything. They, they've got plenty of people in their community to, to fight over what should be the, the next generation Hubble mission. And there are, indeed, probably a dozen active proposals being pushed for the space mission side of the game. So anyway, it's uh, just about an hour, so I'm just going to summarize by saying you know, these are both incredibly powerful and revolutionary instruments. If they both get built, astronomy will be a vital and incredibly interesting field for you know, another half century at the very least. These are, uh, and, and also, in both cases, because of the scale of them compared to existing facilities, you can't just do it the way you've done it before. You can't take the VLA and build a VLA that's 10 times bigger. Nobody will pay for that. So there's been a tremendous amount of work in industry, as much as in any of the science communities or universities, to come up with much lower cost ways to do things. The entire receivers on ships, instead of you know, microwave plumbing and lots and lots of separate components, very broadband feeds, you don't have to have a whole bunch of receiver packages to cover a wide range of frequencies. New algorithms that mean you don't have to store 10 to the 15th bits in memory in order to do calibration. There are just lots and lots of things that all have the potential to be useful for other areas, especially, I think, with some of the data processing advances that have been made over the past several years. Things that have taken things like the square kilometer array, which are going to generate petabytes of data per second, for decades, you know, to take that from a, just an intractable looking data processing problem to something that now looks like, yeah, you know, imagine the computing will have in 2025, this, this might fit. And that's a huge change. That's a, that's a big step forward. Anyway, thanks very much for your attention. I would be happy to answer any other questions that anybody has.
all connecting this data highways between all the <coughs> telescopes um, fiber optics, right? Yes, all fiber optics. And it's in you know, the highest parts of the world. Yes. Is that how they well, it's all, it, it's hard that there, those sites are both desert sites, but that means it's really a change in trench. So the fire is all going to be on the route. You only looked at all the wires were on the surface. Oh, you did a diagram. Yeah, okay. Oh, well, 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 yes, the prototype one. Okay. The, in Australia, they are on the surface because they're still filled up with things. Okay. And that's not a okay. final. Yeah, it's a final version of all the. Okay, very. Because it's basically sand, so it's not. Right. Not like here, where I live up by life. It yeah, yeah, is a lot more work to put a cable on the ground. <laughs> Anything else? Um, do you, uh, what do you see the future of single dish uh, observatories being like Drago Bank and Green Bank and places like that? You know, I think, I think the real future for single dishes is that that's the kind of place where you can train people. That's the kind of place where a grad student can go and get their hands inside the receiver and, and actually put on a, a different kind of feed or you know, do, do something that actually involves the engineering side, not just the computing or the, you know, the, the science in the abstract sense of it. We have a real problem already that a lot of the university observatories that you know, used to be funded by the NSF have been closed down because the NSFs had to put their money into the, the bigger facilities like the DLA that serve the whole community. That was probably the right decision, but it means that a lot of these smaller telescopes that used to be the place where students learned instrumentation aren't available anymore. And so I think you know, that's going to continue, but now the larger single dishes that are now forefront research instruments, when these huge arrays come online, they won't be competitive for research as much anymore. But my hope, at least, is that they will be able to still stay operational as training grounds for the next generation of astronomers and engineers. Because you know, you gotta you gotta always be thinking about training the next generation. We could call that geek account, right? <laughs> <laughs> well thanks very much.